Good morning or good afternoon or evening, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, welcome back to our study in Job. Uh, this week we'll be discussing chapter 26, uh, where Job begins a lengthy response over the next several chapters following Bilidad's final remarks from chapter 25 that Elder Brian unpacked the last time we were together. Now, before we get started, though, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings on this time together in, in this lesson. Father, thank you uh, for the opportunity, God, to come together in this, in, in this manner, Father. Uh, Lord, uh, we pray your blessings upon this time of study in your word, God. And, and Lord, I just pray for those that are, um, that are watching today, Father. I pray that uh, it would be a blessing to them and that, that they would gain not only knowledge uh, for their understanding, Father, but also uh, understanding in their heart that uh, there would be uh, application that would come forth and practice that would be honoring in our lives as well too, Father, as we read through this and we unpack it some. And Father, I pray for those that uh, may be struggling today themselves as we are talking about a man who is suffering greatly, Father, and Father, his need for comfort and encouragement as well too. Uh, but Father, we pray for those that are uh, with us today, Father, that are also struggling and, and suffering in, in different capacities, God. And we pray for their encouragement and we pray for their edification and upbuilding as well, too, in your word as we would go through this today. It's, Lord, we just thank you again for all you're doing. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as this chapter begins with, then Job answered and said... We need to do a quick, uh, brief recap to recall Bildad's final remarks that Job begins responding to here in this chapter, in chapter 26. So with that, in chapter 25, Bildad's remarks could be taken as a reproof against Job's desire to contend with God in regard to a perceived injustice on God's part that Job suspects is the reason for his suffering. Likewise, Bildad stubbornly holds to the assumption that Job's suffering was caused by some yet unconfessed and unknown sin of Job. And with that unfounded assumption of Job's sin, Bildad described a vivid contrast between God's sovereign value on one hand in his holiness and on the other hand to man's wretchedness and worthlessness likened to a worm or a maggot in order to show this chasm between the two. And not least of all, as Job, uh, as Bilidads are, worked at, are directed towards him, uh, towards Job, in this manner. As such, Bildad asks in chapter 25, verse 4, how then can man be right before God? It's a very interesting question, and in and of itself, it's not a bad question, as Elder Brian uh, so astutely pointed out. Uh, he also pointed out that it should be a question that's asked even today, as it would open the door for the shared gospel. However, Bildad's question was not presented as seeking an actual answer that might provide comfort to Job, an, an answer that would help ease his heart in suffering. No, but instead it was, it was presented as a rhetorical question uh, to simply shut Job down and put him in his place as a sinner for some assumed hidden sin. Elder Brian, he also went further to point out that even though there was a degree of truth in Bildad's points uh, regarding the contrast between God and man, his points, however, were misapplied. Again, typical of what has been given Job and counsel so far, so far not only from Bildad, but also from these other so-called friends. It's also typical of Job's so-called friends counsel in some ways to go too far as Bildad neglected at the very least man's inherent value as an image bearer of God and, and thus warning a degree of respect if only for that quality alone. Even so, Bildad does not even concede to show any regard for Job at all, even as a fellow image bearer. In short, Bildad, like the others, has continued to be a poor friend and a poor counselor at best, but at worst, Bildad, like the other two friends, is an instrument of the accuser, that is Satan. As all Bildad has offered in all his counsel is misassumptions, accusations, and condemnation to a, a man who is suffering and who is in need of wise and, and loving counsel. 
counsel that would bring some measure of godly comfort to his suffering. And so that's where we pick up this week, and we are beginning uh, Job's response that covers the next, as I said before, several chapters. And so let's begin with that response here and read chapter 26, and then we'll come back to unpack these verses. So turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Job chapter 26, and we will begin reading there, starting in verse 1. Then Job answered and said, How you have helped him who has no power, how you have saved the man, I'm sorry, how you have saved the arm that has no strength, how you have counseled him who has no wisdom, and plentifully declared sound knowledge. With whose help have you uttered words, and whose breath has come out from you? The dead tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before God, and Abaddon has no covering. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not split open under them. He covers the face of the full moon and spreads over it as spreads over it his cloud. He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters and the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke, but his power, by his power, he stilled the sea. By his understanding, he shattered Rahab. By his wind, the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeting serpent. Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? So be up, before we actually go into unpacking this, it should be noted that scholars differ on who is actually speaking here, specifically in reference to verses 7 through 14. It's a question regarding the placement of these verses that don't actually change the overall interpretation of Job, but it could change how these specific passages are understood depending on who is speaking, again, in verses 7 through 14. It, be it Job or is it actually Bilidad who's speaking? In other words, do these verses present Job's one-upmanship of Bilidad in expanding on the greatness and power of God in making the point of how little Bilidad as well as the other so-called friends knew about God? Or do these verses belong to Bilidad or Bildad adding to his already shared understanding of God's power? That is the remarks in verses 7, 14, having been moved from beneath his remarks in chapter 25 by an unknown scribe in the early years of its transmission, and then placed here now in Job's beginning response. Is that the case? Well, some say yes, they've been moved, while others would say no, they have not been moved. But I agree with those who say the best conclusion to the seeming dilemma is that absent any convincing proof that shows that these verses had been moved, it's best to simply trust the text in the order that it's presented and preserved just as it's been faithfully transmitted over the centuries. If indeed there were any textual variation here, it would clearly stand out in the manuscript history, which it does not. Thus, we trust God is at his inspired word that this chapter in its entirety reflects the thoughts of Job and not those of Bildad. And we interpret it as such, uh, and we do that today as well. So with that, Job begins in verse 2 through 3, with a heavy sarcasm in regard to Bildad's counsel, where he states this, how you have helped him who has no power, how, have, how you have saved the arm that has no strength, how you have counseled him who has no wisdom, and plentifully declared sound knowledge. This declaration of Job's is not offered as a compliment to Bildad. Keep that in mind. In fact, it's actually sarcastic irony underscores the resentment that Job has toward Bilidad and his insulting counsel. Even so, among men, it could be reasonably assumed Bildad had a reputation to be one who possessed understanding in the matters of God. 
He certainly offers without hesitation his insights with that assumption of himself. And as such, it would be expected that he, along with these other so-called insightful friends who knew Job even before his affliction, would have been able to minister strength and comfort to Job's circumstances through their words and so-called wise counsel. But instead, for their part, Job's been wrongly assumed upon. He's been assumed upon and, and accused of hidden, unconfessed sin with no evidence of such that is present. And even now uh, is implied to be nothing less than a worm or a, a maggot, so to speak, in Bildad's final remarks, opposed to a fellow image bearer belonging to God in need of comfort, as already pointed out a number of times. So with that, Job mocks Bildad's counsel because Bildad had truly offered him nothing of value that would have served in any degree to provide strength and comfort from the emotional and spiritual pain that weighed so heavily on his physical suffering. And if there is one thing that holds true in Job's initial remarks here, it's that he is truly without strength. He's a broken man. He's literally destitute in all things, and Bildad has contributed nothing that would aid in answering his need for strength to endure. It's not that Job was asking for the moon, just a little bit of compassion and sympathy. Even the simple offer to pray with him would have gone a long way in bringing some measure of comfort to Job and would have reflected the influence of God's gracious character that works behind such spiritual offerings of those who love God in showing that love toward others. And with that, it's not God's influence that Job is referencing in his own question to Bildad when he asks in verse 4, with whose help have you uttered words and whose breath has come out from you? And as much as Bildad describing man has, inter has had inferred or inferred rather Job to be nothing more than a worm or a maggot, in his final remarks addressed to him, recorded in chapter 25, Job here now infers with his question that Bildad's counsel is no better than a worm or maggot himself. Bildad's haughty self-righteous counsel is surely not from God or even influenced by a right understanding of God's hand in Job's suffering as he has done nothing but miss the mark completely and doing so repeatedly since he and the other so-called friends began to engage with Job. Job's obvious conclusion of Bildad's lack of ability to be a conduit of spiritual strength through wise counsel and comfort here, it reminds me of a once shared piece of advice that was given to me several, several years ago, and it's always stuck with me regarding what I could learn from other leaders. In that, I was advised to never discount what I could learn from any leader, both the good ones and the not so good ones, even the horrible ones. I was told that those who are good leaders will set examples that you'll want to adopt for yourself in managing, counseling, and caring for others. And from those who are not good leaders, even horrible ones, I should take note of their errors in these areas so that I would not repeat those same failed actions myself in the future. And with that, biblically speaking, the scriptures are filled with examples of those we should take note of not repeating their errors as we belong to Christ. And Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz are not least of those that would provide a measure for what poor compassion and poor counsel looks like toward not just a fellow image bearer, but toward a fellow brother or sister in Christ. But even as we have them here in this study for an example on how not to proceed in bringing comforting counsel to another, Scripture also provides us the example of who we should follow. And looking forward in Scripture and forward in time from the time of Job down the road to the Apostle Paul, writing at 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 5, we find our foremost example in providing comfort to the afflicted is none other than God himself through the provision of Christ. Paul writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies 
and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Thus, those who best bring comfort to the afflicted by what they counsel and teach of God will be those who are most grateful and most comforted in their own afflictions by God through the provision of Christ and his suffering on their behalf. This comfort, of course, ministered to them, not least of all, by the one who is the comforter and the counselor, as scripture would describe him, the one who seals us for salvation. That is God's Holy Spirit that indwells the heart of those who belong to Christ today. And with that said, Job's sarcasm not only shows his conclusion of Bildad's wanting in the areas of comforter and counselor, lacking all compassion for Job's needful circumstances. But Job's sarcasm, as I said earlier, also demonstrates a deep-seated resentment for Bildad as he's not only contributed no relief, but instead he's added to Job's suffering. In that Job resents these things, Job resents having been talked down to as a worm and as a maggot. He resents having been relentlessly accused of some non-existent sin, as well as resenting his denial of such sin not being taken seriously. And he also resents being lectured to about the ways of God in such a manner that would indicate he has less understanding of such things than his tormenting counselors, as if his, as if his own understanding of God's ways were childish compared to their own. So with that, Job finding Bildad and the other so-called friends wanting in their merit and ability to offer him any comfort or counsel now goes on in verses 5 through 14 to teach them himself on the power of God that goes beyond even what they've stated of that up to this very point. That God's power is not only the is not only over the realm of the living as they have brought forth, uh, not only over the realm of the living from, from earth to heaven, so to speak, and the things seen and experienced by men, but how that power of God extends even over the realm of the dead. In this, Job doesn't claim their understanding of the extent of God's power was an error, but instead that they haven't gone far enough. By Job expanding what they have already stated of that power then, Job's intent is to demonstrate that his knowledge of God surpasses even that of those who would presume to know better than he of God in their scornful counsel. That he is not only equal in match to them, but he is also their superior. Whereas they declared God's might extending through the natural order of creation and into the visible heavens above, Job goes further now by describing God's power as it extends into the uttermost recesses of Sheol and Abaddon, into the realm of the dead in verses 5 through 6. Job declares this of God, he says, the dead tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before God, and Abaddon has no covering. <clears throat> All of Job's counselors accumulated descriptions of God's extent of power, again, though not an error per se. Their shared understanding really went without saying or question from anyone with a basic experience of God's creation this side of eternity. They basically expounded on stuff that anyone would really know. However, in Job's teaching, even the dead tremble wherever they are found to be even within the unknown depths of the waters of the seas lakes or oceans that which is completely hidden to the experience of the living that is sheol and abaddon the realm of the dead and a mystery to living man it's all laid naked and exposed before god as such job's declaration of this even stands in stark contrast to his earlier uh, wish to be hidden from god in sheol until his perceived wrath on him would pass, until a time 
uh, that is set by God that would then that God would then remember him again uh, with implied fondness as expressed again by Job in Job 14 13. That desire however indicated if not some knowledge but at the very least a hope of resurrection for those dead to return back to the realm of the living. Adding to that here now it's revelatory for Job to further recognize the extent of God's reach and scrutiny even to the most hidden depths of Sheol, the depths that he at one point wished he himself would be hidden in from God's wrath that he assumed was upon him. That not even here, as he previously implied of his own understanding, is anything or anyone actually hidden from God. Now, included within that scope of unknowns to man is Job's amazingly accurate descriptions of God's working power over things that that did not come to mankind's widely held knowledge and understanding until several centuries later. Job describes God's work in verse 7 in creating and in placing the earth within the void of space. He says this, he stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. He describes in verse 8 God's working design behind what we would scientifically describe today as condensation that forms the clouds above, a wonder in design and function to Job. Rightly so, in the weight they bear in water yet float like gossamer through the sky, containing their load without being torn asunder. He says this, he binds up the waters in his thick clouds and the cloud is not split open under them. In verse 10, Job amazingly makes note of God's designed spherical form of the earth as it appears on the horizon of the waters long before Pythagoras put forth any such claim that the earth was indeed round. This is what Job says again in verse 10. He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. And that again is verse 10. In verses 11 and 12, Job now expands on the other natural wonders of God and nature that reveal his power and might when he describes the mountains as pillars of heaven that tremble and are amazed at his rebuke, likely referring to earthquakes in verse 11. God is further described by Job as the one who quieted the sea with his power in verse 12. And that indicates God's power over his creation as well, even the weather according to his sovereignty and, and his desire and wish. And this makes one think about a later time when Jesus calms the storm and the sea recorded in Mark 4 to the amazement of his disciples. Indeed, who he was and, and who he is today revealed in that action to them as well as to us in Scripture. By God's understanding, Job goes on. He also defeated Rahab, a reference to an ancient sea creature, perhaps a reference to Leviathan. In so saying, Job bears witness to God's sovereign control, extending over even the most intimidating creatures of size and scope. It's a more than reasonable conclusion considering that God is the creator of all things. And as such, he has complete understanding of all creation. Uh, and he can do with it as he pleases. One commentator puts it like this, it's not by power alone, but also by wisdom that God overcomes Rahab. With such wisdom and understanding of even the most daunting of creatures, we cannot help but recall imme the immense fish that was appointed by God to swallow Jonah and then expel him after three days onto dry land. However, for all the understanding and observation we may gain of God's might and power in all that he has created, it's still as Job states in verse 14, but the outskirts of his ways, Job says, he calls them a small whisper. In other words, what Job or anyone might ever grasp of God's might and power is really just the tip, not even the tip of the iceberg, but the tip of the tip of the iceberg in understanding God's might and his power. And with that, as we close this lesson, 
It could be reason that Job's own pride is what spurred his initial response here in this chapter, as Job is determined to school those, not least of all Bildad, who he's responding directly to, to school them, uh, that they would assume to school him uh, about the extent of God's power. It's almost like a tit for tat going back and forth. But even so doing, the truth of God's sovereign power in all creation still leads Job to a humbler conclusion regarding God by saying this, his mighty thunder, who can understand? For as much as Job may have comprehended God's reach and power, more so than Bildad and the others, it is providentially ironic that God will ultimately confront Job coming up with the very same argument, but doing so through a litany of questions regarding his sovereign power and wisdom in and over creation that surpasses infinitely beyond even Job's understanding. And as such, and as much as Job ends with a more humble conclusion here, then when confronted by God, Job will not only end even more so humbled, but also repentant at having his understanding deepened of God's ways and power by God himself. Indeed, the more any of us come to learn, the more any of us come to know and understand of God, the more we must admit in humility how much we still have yet to learn. And in a, such a, a mission as that, we should be driven to our knees in worship of God rather than questioning God in any circumstance that we may face in this life. And with that, the words of James seems fitting as we close with prayer tonight. James 4.10, he says this, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to come together uh, this day, Lord. And Lord, I pray for those that, that watch this class and have watched all these classes and will continue to do so to the very end. Father, I pray that each lesson is a further blessing to them, that they would find um, uh, great insight, Lord, uh, but not only uh, to gain knowledge in their minds, Father, but to gain wisdom for their hearts, Father, in the way that they would respond to the circumstances of their own lives, as well as to the lives of others that you would place before them, Father. Lord, help us to be reflective of the comforter, of the counselor that indwells the hearts of those that belong to Christ, Father. Let us, uh, let us be loving towards those that are in need, that are suffering today, God. Let us be good comforters. Let us be good counselors, God. And, and Lord, we thank you uh, for every opportunity that we are given to do such, Lord. And Father, where we fall short, I pray, God, that, that we too would find uh, right conviction uh, through your spirit, God, and that we would be repentant as Job will ultimately become himself, Father, as well as those that would counsel him, Father. Lord, that we would grow spiritually and become more and more useful in your hands, Father, as tools of the gospel, as those that would go forth to give the message of the greatest comfort that there, that there has ever been given. That is that Christ died for our sins. That is that we have a hope beyond this life, beyond all that we would suffer, Father, because of Christ and no other reason. So, Father, with that, we lift this time up to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.